the situations where I failed in, I noticed when the third molar roots are directly touching the second molar roots. Okay, that's what makes it difficult. And if you look at at the classification of that, that's a distal angular impaction. But what makes it so difficult is you can't get your instruments between the second and the third molar. And if you break mm. off the crown of that third molar, you can't even see the mesial root because you can't see past that second molar crown. In this episode, Dr. Neki Jamal will cover all the points you need to know as a GDP if you're extracting wisdom teeth. And that's surgically, what makes it an easy case? What makes it a complex case? What about those cases where you're worried about nerve damage? When do you need to take a CBCT? What about coronectomy? How to get cleaner flaps so that you can take out wisdom teeth in a much more cleaner field, what equipment to use, and how to get cleaner flaps, as well as Neki's main tips to improve your success rates with surgical third molars. Hello, Patricia Ranti, I'm Jazz Galati. My journey with wisdom teeth began when I was a DCT, a dental core trainee at Guy's Hospital. I was doing my oral surgery post, and that's when I started to see my consultants, the way they were removing it. But when I got to do some easier cases, it felt good. And then a few times I got stuck and I needed rescuing. Now, when I went to Singapore, uh, the, the fascinating thing about uh, practicing in Singapore and how that's so different to the UK when it comes to wisdom teeth is like in the UK, we have the nice guidelines and we touch on that in this episode. But in Singapore, I felt as though like the only people that wouldn't have third molars removed is that if you actually had hyperdontia, if you didn't have a wisdom tooth, that's the only time you weren't having them removed. Like it was pretty uh, intense and extreme as about the cases that you'd have wisdom teeth out. So I got a lot more exposure and a lot more experience of taking out wisdom teeth, but I still was uh, staying within my comfort zone or just slightly beyond so that I can improve as a clinician. Now, one thing that really helped me was a 45 degree handpiece. And again, we cover a, li a little bit about equipment and how to get the right armamentarium to improve your extractions. But when I came back to the UK, uh, I was doing less and less. And I'm doing less and less. I'm still happy to take on surgical wisdom teeth, but you see less because of the nice guidelines, right? So we have to be really careful uh, and judgmental about when we take on these third molars. Now, uh, my colleague, uh, John, he he referred me a case recently and I shied away from it. I looked at it and I thought, oh, this is just beyond my comfort zone. I'll share that uh, radiograph if you're watching this, if you're listening, it was a mesial angular and the distal root had a little kink on it and I shied away. So then I was looking at, okay, how can I improve my wisdom teeth? Because I, it was kind of bugging me that I wasn't ready to take on a case like this. So I found Neki Jamal, his course is on Course Karma. So was mine, uh, Splint Course and RBB Masterclass. So I, I started to watch the reviews uh, and some clinical videos uh, of his and, and so I signed on and I've been really enjoying it. I mean, w can you learn wisdom teeth online? Well, it, you know, I have to eat my hat because you can. There were so many clinical videos. Like when I was in Singapore, I was literally relying on YouTube videos uh, and there's only a handful of good ones. Now to have like a bank of 60 plus surgical extraction videos uh, from flaps to actual elevation to closure was absolutely brilliant. So that's what really helped me. So I invited Neki on today to share with you the main way is that we can improve your wisdom teeth extraction, whether you're starting out and you're looking at, okay, how can I pick the low hanging fruit? Versus if you're already extracting out third molars, I know he shares a few gems in there, like the hydraulic flap technique to make your flap raising easier and your sectioning more successful. The protrusive dental pearl I have for you is very relevant to wisdom teeth. And it's actually, when I listened to this episode again, it wasn't covered in the main interview. So it's like a, another big gem that I can reveal to you that I learned from Neki's course, which is this, when you are sectioning a wisdom tooth. Now, obviously we spoke about sectioning and elevating molars uh, with Chris Waite. What a brilliant episode, Chris. Uh, what a great job he did for us. So if you haven't listened to that already, or if you want to listen to more extraction-based episodes, do check out that episode with Chris Waite. Now, when it comes to wisdom teeth, let's say you are going to be sectioning a mesioangular tooth, right? When I have sectioned before, sometimes the section goes off plane and you don't get uh, exactly to the vacation. The big tip here uh, that Neki taught me is that you want to go one to two millimeters more mesial than you think. So you want to start that sectioning a couple of millimeters more mesial than you think. So by the time you actually get to the vacation, you're probably going to be a little bit more distal. If you start where you think is the middle of the tooth, you end up being a bit more distal. And then when you start to section the tooth, you get a, a chunk of the distal part of the crown. You don't actually get to separate the roots. So that for me was a massive takeaway from the course. So I just want to share that with you. Go one to two millimeters more mesial to where you think the vacation is when you are sectioning these mesioangular impacted teeth. Now let's just join Neki for so many gems. It's a really nice jam-packed, gem-packed, concise episode. So I hope you like it and I'll catch you in the outro. Neki Jamal, welcome to the Petrus Dental Podcast. How are you, my friend? 
dude i'm so pumped to be here today i this is a this is a dental dream for me this is this is awesome so thank you so much man <laughs> man it is an honor to have you on man i mean I, I one thing i'm really pissed off about right is where the hell were you in my life in 2016 like i was doing more <laughs> wisdom tooth i was doing more wisdom teeth in 2016 than i ever had done and, and maybe more wisdom teeth in 2016 2017 than i ever will do my entire life i'll tell you why Neki. okay and those listening what was that? i was in singapore I don't know how much you know about uh, the, the way they work in Singapore. Uh, probably very similar to Canada based on what I've seen the videos that you post and stuff uh, is that the only people that don't have wisdom teeth out in Singapore is that if you have the agenesis of or hypodontia of the wisdom teeth. Like if there's a wisdom tooth in your body, they will find it and they will take it out, right? So Good I took God. advantage of that because I had a little bit of a surgical experience and I, I was really stepping out of my comfort zone. And man, I was relying on the, like these sketchy YouTube videos. Like where the hell were you in my life in <laughs> back then, man? But I mean, that, that, I mean just tell me me what tell me about your journey when did you qualify how did you get into uh, so much passion and experience with wisdom teeth you know oh man that, that's so complicated i always found the hardest part about dentistry was connecting with patients we, so many patients were anxious so many patients were nervous and i found that you know by looking people in the eye i was able to calm them down and they knew I was there to actually care for them, which, you know, I think is a missing part in, in oral surgery period. And it's, it's just knowing the patient, knowing that we're here to help them. And so that's how we started getting, getting into taking out teeth. And I always had a passion for helping out. So I started volunteering around the world. I've been on 19 dental brigades all over central and oh, South wow. America, taking out teeth and, and helping those that don't have access to a dentist. And, you know, my skills just grew and grew and grew. And, and, um, you know, it, it led me to this, but I really, you know, started this without a mentor to help me. I was frustrated. I failed over and over and over again. And, you know, I, I thought, why, why does this have to be that way? So I developed systems. You know, I took every single course I could. I talked to every single dentist I could pick up lots of tips and tricks. And uh, yeah, it got me to where I am today. And, and now it's kind of all I do all day, every day is, is take care of anxious patients and, and take out third molars. So you're limited to just uh, wisdom teeth. Is, is, is that what all you do now? Yeah, mainly. Yeah, I'm limited to extractions, basically. Yeah, and I'll, I'll do implants too, but uh, it's mainly sedation and extractions and, and implants, but it's mostly extractions and third molars. Yeah. But uh, are you a like board certified oral surgeon or, or, or not? No, I'm a proud general dentist. I love being a general dentist yeah. because I get to learn everything, man. I get to I get to take Jazz's splint course and apply those principles. <laughs> I get to do restorative. I get to see kids. I get to, you know, see facial traumas. And, you know, the same kids I get to coach in basketball and, you know, fix their teeth when they're a kid. I'm taking out their wisdom teeth when they're 18 years old. And so for me, I'm proud to be a general dentist. Amazing. I, I love your story and I love your enthusiasm and I love the fact that you're a GDP flying the flag for GDPs. But, you know, you're an example of someone who's really found their calling, found their niche within general dentistry. And I love the fact that you're not a specialist, but all the, the videos I've seen of you extract, I mean, you, you've, you've taught it to me better than any specialist could, could ever do. So, so thank you so much uh, and for all you do for the dental community. Uh, so let's dive right in, buddy, and, and, and help yeah, the GPs who are commuting to work or, or sat on the beach. You know, I once, ha I, once I always check my um, who's listening from, you know, around the world. And I love uh, two places that really, um, really resonate with me and really stuck in my mind forever is that in one month, uh, two people from the Maldives listened uh, to my podcast. So I can just imagine like these two dentists on the beach in the Maldives, like, you know, beautiful. And they're just like, you know, eyes shut, just listening to the podcast, which is amazing. And then and two people from Afghanistan uh, listened to me. And I, really? I don't know if you know, I, I was born in Afghanistan uh, and I'm a, I came as a refugee to the country. So uh, Afghanistan's got a huge uh, special place and connection uh, with me. Uh, so I was amazed in one month. So wherever you're on the world listening right now, I hope that Neki and I are going to take you on a journey to help you to to remove wisdom teeth more proficiently, uh, better surgical technique, and to avoid failures. Just like you experienced so many failures, I experienced so many failures as well. Lots of frustrations, messy flaps and stuff. We're going to get into that, but no more after today's episode. So first question for you, yeah. Nikki, is let's start, with, <laughs> let's start with easy cases. Like if you're a new grad, right? And sometimes you're like looking at wisdom teeth and you're just automatically scared because it has that label, right? Wisdom tooth. 
yeah. what are the features, clinically and radiographically, to look at that 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 make that deem these wisdom teeth as low hanging fruit? What are the easy ones? What are the features that we should look out for? For sure, and you know, and to your point, I think it's it's embarrassing that our dental education, our, our dental schools, aren't teaching us how to safely and efficiently take out third molars, and it, it's almost like a letdown to us. It's a disservice uh, to our patients. So, um, no, I'm glad to share a, a bunch of secrets today and a bunch of tips and tricks. But if I was going to say a low hanging fruit. For new grads, you know, you want to start with younger patients. One of the main complicating factors of third molars, especially taking out third molars, is older patients tend to have, you know, more dense bone. Their roots are fully developed. And we know uh, third molars, they tend to have big curvatures or dilacerated roots. And, you know, those older patients are going to have more uh, post-operative complications as well. So when you're getting into third molars, maybe stay away from, from some of those. If you want to dive into third molars, maybe take on cases with younger patients. So my favorite time to take out third molars is anywhere between 14 and 25 years old, 14 only if they're like, you know, developed already. Um, but you want to go after conical roots. You don't want to have, you know, multiple roots that are, that are divergent and, and they're just, you know, grabbing in there because those aren't cases to start out, out with. You want to start with conical roots, maybe not fully formed roots. So, you know, if a tooth just isn't coming in the right way and the roots aren't fully formed and they still have a bit of a follicle around them, that's a great time to get those third molars out of there because they're only going to cause problems. And so if you want to get into third molars, just stick to younger patients because uh, chances are you're going to have more success. I mean, I had flashbacks of you mentioning about conical roots and I remember being a DCT. So it's like a one or two years out of dental school I was in a guy's hostel uh, and I started doing these wisdom teeth and uh, I had one on my list one of my first ones uh, and at the time like I wasn't so great at assessing radiographs of what makes a, a simple extraction versus a complex one uh, and I had one yeah. with, the, with conical roots and literally took the luxator to it and it popped right out and at that, that, that day I felt like yeah I'm a champion you know and then you see uh, other teeth and you're, you're, you're really in the depths of despair you're really struggling and you feel like the worst like a, you know too well that a, a, a difficult Difficult wisdom tooth can, can can humble even the most experienced oral surgeon, right? So yes, conical roots on young people. Now, people listening around the world right now would have heard you say, you know, 14 to 25 age uh, and, and anywhere else in the world. But yeah, that, that, that makes sense. But in the UK, we have these nice guidelines, right? I was just going to say that. Totally. They're messed up, man. Neki, you know, yeah. buddy, they are messed up. The amount yeah. of people I see on a monthly basis who absolutely have their, their, their second molars destroyed from caries from these third molars is ridiculous. Um, so yeah, in the UK, we're in a uh, crappy situation, which is why I said that in Singapore, I was taking out more wisdom teeth than I am in the UK at the moment, even though I'm like far more skilled and knowledgeable now compared to what I was back then. Absolutely. And it comes down to caries, periodontal concerns, uh, you know, association of, of potential cysts in tumors, external root resorption. Like there's there's so many reasons why we don't need to have those third molars in our mouth. And then, you know, when that patient is 40, has a bombed out second molar, uh, a mesioangular or horizontally impacted third molar, you end up taking out an extra tooth there when, you know, that tooth probably wouldn't have had to come out anyway. And so to do it younger, that patient heals so much faster. They don't have the pain and, you know, all the associated post-operative complications of waiting. So I understand the NICE guidelines and um, I have full respect for all the clinicians in, in all the parts of the world. But, you know, here in Canada and in North America, we follow the AAOMS white paper. And that's, you know, put out to say all the reasons why third molars uh, should stay or should or they should be removed. And not every third molar needs to be removed, but the ones in certain positions may, may you know, need to be. So, yeah. What does that white paper, Neki, say about uh, people who are struggling to keep the area clean and they're, and they're not necessarily getting like full-blown pericronitis, but it's, it's a irritation, uh, inflammation, maybe an episode of pericronitis. Uh, would that be uh, good enough? I absolutely think so. Um, because, you know, just because you don't have um, symptoms, that doesn't mean pathology isn't there. And so that's really what it comes down to. And that's the same thing for periodontal concerns. Just because you have a six millimeter pocket distal to the second molar 
and you don't know it's there. That doesn't mean that that's a full breeding ground of bacteria. That's, you know, a harboring bacteria that can go all over. And so I, I'm a firm believer in, you know, taking out third molars as they need to be taken out, especially, you know, if you consider where all the bacteria is and in pericoronitis, it's only going to get worse. And so the younger the patient is, I think just the better it is to get those out of there, especially in cases like that. Which is why the, the NICE guidelines are so frustrating. But let's, let's not uh, uh, you know, delve too deeper into that. It's out of our control. Yeah. Hopefully in the UK we can improve that. Uh, but still, we can, you know, we can improve our technique when the, when the time comes to do it. But we shouldn't fall into the trap of that really difficult one that perhaps we think, OK, we should have referred. So what are the, the main features in a radiograph or clinically that, you, that help us to know that, whoa, this one's maybe really tricky and we should refer this? You know, uh, this took me years to develop and I kind of made my own guidelines and, uh, you know, I read a ton of research papers. I've, I've done a ton of third molars. I've failed on a lot of third molars and I started to go back and see like, what about this x-ray did I find so difficult? What about this patient did I find so difficult? So honestly, let's just break it down. Okay. So let's look at angulation. If you're going to take on third molars, everyone's looking at angulation first. Okay. So mesioangular is a lot easier to take out than a distal angular. And we'll talk about the reason for that in a sec. And a lot of uh, like DDPs, they get stuck right away. They, they can see a third molar and they're like, oh, I can take that out. I can see it. But if that tooth is distal angular, that's what makes it so, so difficult. So that's where a lot of GDPs get stuck. Um, age right off the bat. Older patients, like we said before, going to be much more difficult. Um, root development. Is the roots fully developed? Are they partially developed? Or, you know, are, are there any roots at all? You know, fully developed roots are going to be much more difficult. Um, PDL space. Is there, you know, a, a tiny PDL? Is there a PDL, especially on older patients? No PDLs. That makes them more difficult. But these two characteristics right here, which I want to talk to you about, these really set the stage for me in looking at third molars and easily being able to determine is this going to be easy or is this going to be hard so the first one i want to tell you about is proximity to the second molar and no one taught me this but experience myself and so i you know i failed over and over again and the situations where i failed in i noticed when the third molar roots are directly touching the second molar roots Okay, that's what makes it difficult. And if you look at, at the classification of that, that's a distal angular impaction. But what makes it so difficult is you can't get your instruments between the second and the third molar. And if you break mm -hmm. off the crown of that third molar, you can't even see the mesial root because you can't see past that second molar crown. So that played a huge role for me. Have you found that too? 100%. But the way you uh, taught it to me was um, different or better than any other way. Like people just say, oh, distal angular is difficult. Yeah, remember, D, D, distal angular, difficult. But it's the whole looking at the root and, and, and the lack of space that you have to put your instrument. And then, you know, when you taught me about uh, keeping a, a lever, it is the, that term, you right? Uh, and the handle, sorry, keeping a handle. Yeah, keeping the, the, the handle. Musical handle. Yeah. And that was exactly. Yeah. So just explain about uh, what, what, what you mean by keeping the handle. Yeah, so um, a lot of, in, like, to be honest, there's multiple, multiple different ways to take out a tooth. As long as the tooth comes out, that's the right way. I like to teach keeping the mesial part of the tooth for as long as possible, especially when you have that, you know, close proximity when the roots of the third molar are touching the roots of the second molar. And so keeping that mesial part of the handle gives you almost an ori or gives you, uh, the mesial part of the tooth gives you almost like a map to the tooth. If you lose your crown, you almost lose your ability and your orientation of where that tooth is. And so I find by removing the distal half of the tooth, I can create space in the socket to manipulate that tooth to, to, you know, extract the tooth. But a lot of GDPs, you know, they go after that mesial part because they feel like that's what's holding it up. And, uh, and I find it's always the, the distal part, you know, that's either hitting distal bone or it's, you know, caught up in the soft tissue. So I try to keep my mesial handle as much as possible. Okay, so uh, proximity to the second molar, uh, any others? Yeah, my last one here, and this is what I call the depth of application. So since we're keeping the mesial portion of the tooth, we're usually going to be, going to be elevating on the, on the mesial, um, on that mesial crown there at the CEJ. And so what I like to do is, um, I like to separate the second molar roots into thirds. So we set, we second it like the most uh, top third here is easy. The middle third is medium difficulty and the lower third of the second molar root is difficult. And if we match the third molar up to the second molar roots and see where the mesial CEJ is of that third molar, we can 
almost have a guesstimate of how difficult this tooth is going to be to access. So if that depth of application is deep and it's, you know, very apical in relation to that second molar, that's often going to be a very difficult tooth to get to, and it's going to be a difficult tooth to, to remove. And so a quick and dirty way of looking at it at a difficult case real quick is just look at the depth of application in relation to that second molar root, and you almost have a telltale sign of, you know, how easy it's going to be to get to this tooth. Okay, brilliant. And yes, I can totally uh, visualize that trying to trying to put your instrument, your luxator or elevator at that point uh, and how much uh, less visibility you have, the deeper it is. So uh, that's covered that uh, nicely. Uh, the thing that really concerns most of us when we're starting out with wisdom teeth is, as well as assessing the difficulty is, is the nerve, right? Like we, like I want, I, I am personally, like I have got a phobia of being responsible being that dentist who caused that nerve damage on a patient. So um, I remember in that same job role, I told you about that DCT position at Guy's Hospital, starting to get, get patients referred to the hospital for wisdom teeth, being on the consultant clinics, and any tooth that had roots, even like close, let alone superimposed, I was like freaking out. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, you know, the risk, the risk. But my consultant would come by and he'd be like, you know, calm down. Okay, it's just superimposition. So what are the actual three or four things that we're looking for that will determine a high risk of inferior alveolar nerve damage? Absolutely. And, and really, this goes back, I think, to both of our dental education. And, you know, we see this paper by, uh, you know, Rude and, and Shabab in 1990, the, the landmark paper of radiographical features. And we see them in dental school, the seven, the seven pictures of the tooth and the nerve. And the pictures were almost blurry. You know what I mean? Like, and that's almost an indication of what you see in real life, because on the panoramic, x-ray the tooth looks blurry anyway so you can't even see where the nerve is in relation to the tooth so we just weren't educated properly so there's you know there's four four you know relationships between the tooth and the nerve uh, that's re related to the tooth and three that are related to the canal but you know let's just wash our hands of all that I want to share with you the, the three signs that I look at okay so the first one is darkening of the roots okay when I see a darkened root in relation to the mandibular canal or the inferior alveolar canal um, I know that there could be a close relationship going on and it doesn't mean that if you take out that tooth they're going to have uh, a nerve injury or paresthesia but it just means that there's a higher risk of it. And so we have to talk to our patients about that, but we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, the other two uh, signs is diversion of the canal in relation to that third molar. So if that third molar like uh, is, is in position and then the canal literally goes around it, I call that diversion of the canal. And that's a, a sign of a high risk um, association between the tooth and the, and the nerve. And then the last one is loss of the white line of the canal. So if you see your third molar, but you can't, you can't really see the white line of the canal in relation to that third molar. That's another indication that that's a high risk uh, tooth to come out. But um, what I found is, you know, we have our signs. It doesn't mean that, you know, we're going to have, you know, a nerve injury. But it's important to talk to your patients about this. And so say, you know, you talk to your patient and you tell them that there's a high risk of nerve injury and you always give it back to them. And you're like, are you OK with taking out this tooth? These are the reasons why I think you should take it out. These are the reasons what could happen if you don't take it out. OK, but it's up to you. What, what do you want to do? And if you do that, and if you take your time to explain to your patients, you know, the pros and cons, risks and benefits of taking out that tooth in relation to that, you know, possible nerve injury, and they get a nerve injury, they're more likely to work with you than against you. And so patients always do much better with explanations than with excuses after the fact. So you have to take your time to educate your patients, show them, you know, why this is a high risk tooth and what would happen with a possible nerve injury. Amazing. So darkening of the root, uh, deviation uh, of the canal and loss of the continuity uh, of the of the cortical lines uh, of the inferior alveolar nerve. Those are three main signs, as you taught me as well. Uh, and that's really useful to go by. Now, as I told you, my fear of being that dentist who's ultimately responsible. So uh, my threshold for a CBCT is quite low. Like if I see if, if definitely if I see any of those three signs, I'm thinking, OK, CBCT. But sometimes if I don't see those three signs, but the, you know, the, the, the root is superimposed of the canal, I sometimes will be like, okay, maybe you should get a CBCT because I'm a chicken. Uh, I'm practicing defensive dentistry in a way. What do you think is your threshold for CBCT? And does the CBCT change your management in any way or when you actually go to remove the tooth? You know, that, that's a great question. And first of all, I don't think you're a chicken. I think you care about your patients. 
And so I think that's that's a huge factor right there. If we want to be cowboys and, and cowgirls and 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 just go after every single third molar, we wouldn't really care about taking a CBCT. So my threshold is quite low, just like you. Why wouldn't we want more information when we have the ability to get more information? If you were going to get your third molar out, you know, you're 35 years old, you've had you know chronic pericoronitis, but there's a, a one of the close relationships like we were discussing, wouldn't you want your, your dentist to have all the information possible? So we have to think about it from the patient point of view. So my threshold is quite low as well. Definitely. If I see those three, three uh, indications, I'm always taking a CBCT and what I'm looking for on the CBCT that n maybe not everyone uh, understands is if we lose cortication of the mandibular canal, in, in relationship with that tooth. So if the tooth root and the canal are touching and there's no more cortication of that canal, that's when we're like, okay, this is a high risk extraction. That doesn't mean that they're going to get a nerve injury, but there's a higher chance of that. So I always like to take a CBCT. And the other thing that I'm looking for on a CBCT is the tooth in relation to the cortical plate. So in cases where we see darkening of the root, that may indicate that we have the, the actual tooth roots embedded in that lingual cortical plates or actually extending beyond it. And so what if you break a root tip, you know, which may happen, and then you go fishing for that root tip and you can push that root tip into a, an anatomical space because it's already beyond the lingual plate. But if you didn't have that CBCT, you may not know that. So I think the mm -hmm. CBCT provides you invaluable information and I encourage you to take them whenever you're unsure. Amazing. You covered that really well. Now, one question I also had when I when I uh, told everyone on the Telegram group that, hey, you know, we're going to be talking wisdom teeth with Neki uh, is Cameron Ali. He had this question about uh, coronectomies. Okay. When would you, uh, and obviously you covered it in the course. Are you intimidated and just not confident when it comes to taking on third molars? Feel like you're in this profession all alone without a mentor to help you with those tricky wisdom tooth extractions? Yeah, I did too, but I got you. Let me guide you through the entire process of taking out surgically impacted third molars. You don't have to go at it alone anymore. I will walk you through from start to finish with real life clinical videos of treatment planning cases, assessing risk, pan and CBCT analysis, the tools you need for the job, and all the tips, tricks, and tutorials of extraction techniques you'll ever need. But most importantly, I wanna teach you how to manage the surgical and post-operative complications, because at the end of the day, I know you wanna do what's best for your patients. Don't let fear stop you from growing your practice and taking your surgical skill set to the next level. With clinical videos, lessons, and an optional online mentorship through one-on-one -on -one sessions, I want to share my experience and my passion for third molar extractions with you to set you up for success. We got this. Let's go. But when would you consider a coronectomy, which leads on quite nicely to, to the talk about risk and CBCTs? Absolutely. I think a coronectomy is a great option when you do have a high risk scenario. So say you have an older patient um, who is more likely to get a, you know, post-operative uh, nerve injury in comparison to a younger patient, you know, with a similar relationship. Um, why not do a coronectomy? But you have to do the coronectomy properly. You can't just cut off the crown and then expect, you know, everything to be okay. There's a couple tips and tricks that I, maybe I can share with you here. If you're going to do a coronectomy in a high risk, you know, uh, nerve possible nerve injury situation, you want to make sure you remove all the enamel of that crown. So what I like to do is I like to cut off that tooth root uh, or that tooth crown three millimeters below the CEJ. And that way we ensure that, you know, all that um, all that enamel is gone because the, the thought of a coronectomy is if we can bury the roots, we want bone to gr grow over top but we know bone doesn't grow to enamel. So you have to make sure you get rid of all the enamel. So I like to make sure that my bone level is three millimeters above my actual root. Okay, so there's a three millimeter gap there. And second, you, you want to make sure in my experience when I do coronectomies, I always try to get primary closure. If I don't get primary closure, I find, you know, it doesn't always close up the way I want it to. Um, and you know, that that could be okay, but try to get primary closure. And the cool part about a coronectomy is one of two things are going to happen. Either the tooth is going to, you know, continue to erupt away from the mandibular canal where you can take it out if the patient is having a, an issue or bone grows right over. I think those are two great scenarios you, that you can either take out the tooth without a you know, risk of a mandibular nerve injury 
or bone grows right over and you let it be. So I think a coronectomy is a phenomenal option. I used to work with um, a consultant or a surgeon called Chris Sprout uh, at Guy's Hostel. Uh, and he was uh, really like well known for uh, coronectomies and really uh, pioneering and championing uh, coronectomies uh, in, in London, the UK. Uh, so I learned a lot from him. I remember being on his clinic and, and you know, just as you said, the, I didn't know, I didn't realize at the time that is so important to make sure you don't even have a single prism of enamel. You just won't get the healing. So you've echoed that already. Uh, and one more thing is that if you are going to try this at home or in the office is um, uh, just as you taught me as well, make sure that if the roots do mobilize, i.e. you're trying to, you're trying, you're aiming to do a coronectomy, but by accident, you, you know, the roots start moving, then and you got to take it out, right? Uh, explain a little bit more about that. Yeah, totally. Like you can't, you can't leave mobile roots in there because they're not going to heal, but also infected roots. You don't want to leave an infected root. If it is in close proximity to that mandibular uh, canal, you can't leave infected roots in there. Those aren't going to heal over. That's just going to continue to get infected. So you have to take those out. Um, you know, will a coronary, will a coronectomy work a hundred percent of the time? No. But I think it's a great option to try, especially in very high risk scenarios. And uh, I think it's a great option. I do coronectomies uh, when I have to, but not every indication is a, is a chance to do a coronectomy. Absolutely. Now, the, the next question I want to ask you is about flaps, right? Because I've been in a situation where... Unfortunately, my, you know, um, periosteum is, is tearing a little bit. Uh, I haven't done as clean as of a flap as I'd like to. So uh, it's something that for me, once you get a decent flap, as you've shown so many times in the videos that you share, it's so, so critical to see that nice, clean bone. And I love the videos of you just moving away the flap so nicely. I wish every one of my flaps uh, looked like yours. But I learned so much from you, which is the, the main thing I learned from flaps was that Previously, when I've done my incisions, uh, I have failed to go over my incisions again and again and again and again and again, like four or five times, just like you teach. And, and that is the main lesson I want to pass on to Patrice Rati listening today is that don't just make the incision once and that's it. Go over it, especially in that distal, distal area uh, of, of your tooth where you have a dense connective tissue as you taught it. Uh, so um, just expand on that. And what other tips and tricks? And I know there's one that you love about the hydraulics. Tell us about that as well <laughs> to get really clean flaps because that is a real game changer. Yeah. So I think a huge part of third molar extractions is respect for the periosteum. And I'm sure you'll agree with me there because if we have messy flaps, your patient comes back, you know, a week later, they're still in pain. There's a ton of swelling. The, the gingiva just doesn't look good. And really, we feel really bad as clinicians when our surgeries aren't clean, when our patients aren't healing. So number one, you have to respect the periosteum and how we respect the periosteum is by making clean flaps. So when you're making your flap, I want you to think of you making your flap with intention and confidence. Okay. It's not just, okay, I think I'll make an incision here. Oh no, I don't like that incision. Let, let's make it over here now. And then you just tear up the periosteum. There's bleeding and swelling. So we don't want, we don't want that. So a trick that I use over and over again is I make my incisions with intention and confidence, but then I go over my incision at least four times. Okay. And if I go over it twice, it's not good enough. Sometimes there's dense connective tissue, especially in cases of a partially erupted third molar with, you know, chronic pericoronitis, that tissue is kind of attached on that tooth pretty good. So you have to go over your incision at least four times. Okay. And then another tip that I use is a lot of us in school were taught to use the Molt 9 periosteal elevator. It's huge. It doesn't allow us to get to where we need to. And that's how I was ripping a lot of flaps uh, as well earlier. So I use a smaller periosteal elevator. It's called a P24G. And um, it's, it's a great little tool for reflecting a nice clean flap, as I'm sure you've seen there, uh, Jazz. But I want to share with you another tip. And you can use this tip anywhere in the mouth. Okay, and it's called the hydraulic flap. And what we need to do, and the goal of whenever we reflect a full thickness flap, is we want to get that periosteum right off the bone. And it's just so clean when it comes off the bone. We don't want to tear the periosteum. So, a little trick that I do is I'll use a short uh, needle, like for anesthesia, and I'll just inject my lidocaine all the way to bone, all along my flap. And I almost bubble up the tissue a little bit. And you know exactly what I'm talking about when you just hit bone and then that tissue bubbles off and that's that hydraulic flap I'm talking about so then when you make your incision that flap literally peels right off the bone because we've already got that periosteum off the bone and that's a 
a tip you could use anywhere in the mouth and it just works great. That's a, a massive tip. And it's, it's, it's funny, you know, you, you wait for these gems and then uh, they come along at the same time. So G uh, George talked about uh, hot pulps and failed ID blocks. And he he mentioned it to me um, about uh, eight weeks ago. And then I saw it got, again on your course and he actually had the, the clinical demonstration of it. And I thought, wow, this is so, so good. Uh, so um, I just want to just uh, ask you a little bit more about that. When you are injecting, are you in the attached uh, gingiva or are you more in the um, muco beyond the mucogingival line in the free tissues when you're doing that? Yeah. That's a great point. I actually go right at the mucogingival junction. And so okay. it's it's easy to do. So you get a little bit of both. Um, I find if you go in the mucosal area, the flap usually reflects quite easy off that anyway. It's usually around the mucogingival junction and, and the attached tissue that you have to start reflecting your tissue. And I always start, you know, at the papilla and uh, I, I go, you know, distally from there. So that's what I found works really well for me is just injecting along the mucogingival junction. And you just want to bubble that tissue. It takes it takes not even two seconds. So it's a great tip to do. I mean, that's a top tip. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm itching to go for my next wisdom tooth case so I can I can try it. Obviously, we had the, uh, a mentoring session which you gave me and we talked about this case that's upcoming for me. So I'll let you know how that goes. Um, yeah. And armamentarium, like when I was in Singapore, and I keep referring back to Singapore, but that was a big part of my journey with wisdom teeth because I was just doing uh, a lot more of them. I knew um, I, I hated using the straight hand piece. I used it once in hostel. I just hated the access. I know you use both and you're very proficient at both, but I needed something that was super Super GDP friendly. Uh, and so I bought the, the 45 degree NSK uh, handpiece uh, while I was in Singapore because uh, the uh, exchange rate was good and it was uh, on offer. So I was like, yes, this is great. Uh, I also bought myself a, a, a normal um, a red ring uh, electric handpiece for my preps and stuff. Uh, absolutely fantastic. L loved, love these uh, handpieces. But the 45 degree one, it's like purpose built for wisdom teeth and for sectioning. Uh, and and, and then when, I, when I saw on your course that you were recommending that handpiece, I was like, oh my God, I'm so lucky that I actually have this exact same one that Neki uses. So tell us, uh, uh, about armamentaria and maybe just give me a few tips for you know if I eventually need to use a straight handpiece and do tell us when you might think uh, we need to use that surgical handpiece rather than the 45 degree i.e. what might be a potential disadvantage of that 45 degree handpiece oh totally okay so first of all I use a 45 degree angled handpiece 98% of the time I Thank love goodness. my 45 year angled handpiece and I know we have the exact same one and I just think that they're the best hand pieces out there. And I think as, as GDPs, we like using things that are familiar. So if the, a 45 year angled handpiece is not too different from our regular um, hand pieces that we use for, you know, operative dentistry. So um, I love the 45 year angled handpiece. It feels great and it gives you good visibility. Now um, the problem with the 45 year angled handpiece Okay, is you're always going to wish your burr was just a little bit longer, especially if you have a more impacted tooth, you're going to wish you just could get a little bit deeper. And unfortunately, you always you can't always do that. So that's when a straight hand piece comes into play. But even for me, I feel a straight hand piece is is not I don't get the same tactile ability as I do with a, a straight hand piece. I uh, the, the straight hand pieces always just feel a little foreign to me as well. Um, where a straight hand piece shines is for horizontally impacted third molars when that frication is just a little bit deeper because your 45 degree angled hand piece may not be able to get all the way to the frication to section the roots. Just just because of the position of it. So that's where a straight hand piece works well. But for, you know, a vast majority of the cases, 45 degree angled hand pieces are the way to go. They're easy, they're reliable, and uh, they feel normal in our hands as, as GDPs. So I highly, highly recommend them. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love the 45 degree one. But with the straight hand piece, I found that um, access to there was just probably because it's unfamiliar the way you hold it in your hand and also the patient's lip you have to move it uh, yeah. uh, you know to get access to area you have to really you know m move that cheek out the way a lot more but you know it's also one of those things that the more if i was to use uh, the surgical handpiece more the straight one then i would become better at it so it's one of those things that you know the more you effort you put in the more time you put in the the, the more proficient you, you would become using that particular uh, armamentarium for sure but for gdps like we're using not everyone is going to be doing third molars all day. So is it, you know, worth the investment to spend a ton of money getting a straight surgical handpiece? Or can you use that 45 degree angled handpiece and you can use it, you know, to section an upper first uh, molar and you can section a lower third molar. So I think, you know, in terms of, um, you know, armamentarium, 
that we can use everywhere as as GPs, I would go with the 45 degree angle myself. That was one of the best investments I've made in, in equipment, um, that, that 45 degree no handpiece, because uh, I yeah. took out loads of wisdom teeth in Singapore, uh, and it was all thanks to that handpiece, uh, because it just gave me the confidence and uh, the access that I really needed. So uh, I'm so, again, like I said, I'm so glad that that's the one you recommended as well, uh, which takes me to my uh, last question, Neki, before we just uh, uh, do the outro is your big three tips okay to dentists everywhere who maybe uh are have taken a few wisdom teeth out for uh, and they just need uh, a, a few nuggets a few gems can you just share with us your three magic necky tips no problem no problem okay so my first tip right off the bat clean incisions respect the periosteum clean flaps the cleaner your flap is, the, the more you'll be able to see, the less stress you'll have because you're not constantly pulling on your flap and the faster that patient's going to heal. So right off the bat, you have to get good at flaps. No more messy flaps. And, and Jazz, just like I showed you, flaps do not have to be messy. You just go over your incision numerous times. You use the right uh, instruments and you know where to make your incisions to just literally open that area up so easily and so quickly. To make a messy flap takes longer than it does to make a clean flap. So right off the bat, you have to get proficient at flaps and it's not difficult. Um, two is the key to third molars, in my opinion, is hitting the furcations and sectioning teeth. If you want to get faster at taking out third molars, hit your furcations. And I made stickers and it's and my stickers all say I give them to all my people and I'm like, man, hit your furcations. And that's <laughs> what third molars is all about. If you get good at hitting your furcations, you're taking out third molars. Okay. And lastly, after you've taken out the tooth, it's all about rinsing your flap. I'm not rinsing the socket. I'm rinsing my flap. If we can get all the little shards of bone and tooth and all the gunk that comes along with extractions off of our periosteum before we close it up, you're going to find patients heal so much faster and they don't come back with a lot of post-operative concerns. I feel a lot of post-operative concerns comes from having messy surgical sites. So if we can have clean flaps, we rinse the area, smooth bone, we use a bone file after we take out third molars, we don't want jagged bone around there, everything's smooth, everything's clean, we've rinsed our flap, and we close it up, you're gold. Amazing. Neki, you've honestly uh, covered so much in the last, I don't know, like 35, 40 minutes. Uh, that was really uh, gem packed, as I like to call it. Uh, I mean, the way I found you was um, I'm, I'm basically my colleague, John. I know you listen to this. Hello, John. Uh, baby number two coming for you soon, very, uh, John. So I'm very excited for you, John, when you listen to this. So John works with me. Uh, he's actually my boss. Uh, and he referred me these wisdom teeth. And I looked at them and it was just just tiny bit beyond my comfort level, right? Uh, and I shied away. And it was really bugging me. <clears throat> and it was really bugging me that, okay, I wish I had uh, someone to, to mentor me, hold my hand through this. Uh, and so that, you know, obviously I saw your course on Course Karma. Uh, you know, Splint Course also was on Course Karma. So was the RBB Masterclass. Uh, so then um, started speaking. Uh, I've been doing your course now. You had that one-to-one -one mentorship with me as well to discuss exactly those cases. So if anyone wants to see how to take out this, this wisdom tooth, this mesioangular wisdom tooth, which which did actually concern me and worry me. Uh, and then also the same patient, upper right third molar, um, mesioangular, quite um, less common, obviously, for an upper wisdom tooth. And you just completely alleviated all my concerns. You talked me through exactly how I'm going to do it. You showed me some clinical videos. So now I'm totally ready to target that. But your entire course, the third molar experience, was just phenomenal. Now, I was um, telling my um, uh, Petrucerati on the Protrusive Dental Community Facebook group. So guys, if you're not on this group already, uh, please uh, search it on Facebook, join us. Uh, and I was telling these guys, okay, I'm doing this wisdom tooth course. It's okay so far. 200 lessons. Oh my God. I, was like, okay, that, that's, I mean, that's amazing. 200 lessons. But I was like, I was like desperate to get through it, get through it, get through it. Because just you did the same thing that I do on my splint course, which is you don't rush to the, the, the juicy bits that the dentist really want, right? The dentist wants the clinical videos, right? I was desperate for these YouTube videos in 2017. Whereas you saved them all, like, I don't know, 50, 60 of them, of all these like yeah. surgical uh, extractions that you do, which is absolute gold. 
But I, I respect the fact that you really covered the theory, the flaps, the everything we talked about, the, when to get a CBCT, uh, how to manage um, um, pre-optive complications, post-optive pain, before you then literally throw all this gold of, 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 of clinical videos, which, you know, massive kudos to you, how you organize that. So that's been absolutely brilliant. Uh, and uh, I, I think we've been emailing and it'd be really kind of you, Neki, to offer anyone who's listening uh, who wants to learn wisdom tooth surgery uh, from the third model experience, 15% discount. Uh, using the code protrusive is that right yeah protrusive yeah for your for your group man i uh i i think this course i created this course because so many people have fear and frustration of third molars and it doesn't need to be that way why don't why don't we have people teaching this out there because we all have to take out these third molars and we don't do it correctly so why not teach us all how to do it but it's it's not taught easily in dental schools and and so i wanted to to fill that gap and and be the mentor that you know i didn't have when i was going through it so i'm really proud of this course it took me years to make and i've poured it my took heart and like soul a into lot it. of hard work i mean even <laughs> yeah. just to get the clinical views and 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 some videos you actually on purpose made it to like it felt as though I was there, I was extracting it, the way you angled it, and you made a point, so can I, I've made it record this video, so you feel as though you are, uh, you know, lower right molar tooth, you you are using the the blade to make the incision, and what I learned on that, is, you know, not only has helped me to, to take on these courses, also with your mentorship, which I'm so grateful for, for that specific case, uh, I, I know you're you're there to support, and, and the, <laughs> I just remember that, she sent me this personalized uh, WhatsApp video, it was like, hey Jazz, great to have you on the course, uh, look forward to speak, that, that was a, a real surprise, but I was also proud <laughs> that I was the first ever delegate to send a video back to you. <laughs> yes. Ever, half the people don't even text me back, but it's, I think it's, it's cool. I like to, to meet the people in my course. I don't want you to take the course and then I never get to talk to you. So I like to, you know, carve out time and talk to everyone individually, see what they're having problems with, because if we're not here for each other, what are we doing this for? I'm literally here to help you. And, and I've dedicated my evenings after, you know, taking out third molars in the day. I, I want to help my fellow dentists because we all need to get better together. You really do uh, live and breathe third molars. And honestly, it, it really shown through uh, in the course. Uh, absolutely fantastic. But uh, like I said, I had my reservations, Naki, that, okay, can you learn third molars online? And what you showed with the videos and the number, the, the quantity and the quality of the videos made me feel so much more confident. Plus the mentorship that you offer was amazing. So guys, if you're looking for a third molar course, uh, Neki's is the one to do. Do use the, the, the code he's generously offered, 15% off. It's protrusive. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it just shows how much hard work you put in. So Neki, thank you for that course. Thank you for mentoring me. Uh, I'm going to obviously send you some photos of these roots that when I, when I hit that vacation, and I get those roots out. I'm gonna send them. I'm gonna WhatsApp them straight to you, brother. That's right. I'm gonna send you out some stickers now too, because you gotta hit those vacations <laughs> every day. You need to remind yourself of that, man. So it's gonna be that's great. Such a cool. That's such a cool tagline, man. Uh, Neki, thanks so much for for uh, tackling all those. Uh, Cameron, thanks for questions that you sent in on our Telegram group. By the way, if you're not on our Telegram group, it's protrusive.co.uk forward slash Telegram. There's so many great dentists. I've seen over over like almost 400 dentists on that Telegram group, uh, and it's just it'd be great to have you guys on if you're listening. Uh, Neki, join that. Are you on Telegram, Neki? Uh, no, I'm going to have to. Though. Okay, you will be now. Download Telegram on your phone. Now. Uh, join yeah. our Telegram. It's like, it's like WhatsApp on steroids, okay? So join our Telegram oh, group okay, okay. and you will be our yeah. resident third molar mentor. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I really appreciate you coming on, Neki. Thank you so much. Um, have an awesome weekend. What are you up to? Man, this is a huge honor for me. Uh, you know, just just heading to the office. We have we're expanding our office right now. After all this COVID stuff, it's hard to find workers, so everything's behind. So you know, I'm I'm just trying to play catch up and and having fun doing it. So it's good. Well, thanks for carving out time for this. But also, I just remembered when we had that mentoring session. Okay, it was like I don't know, ten thirty here. I, uh, it was four thirty a.m. and you look so fresh and so good and so pumped. Uh, I, I was absolutely amazed, blown away by the service. So <laughs> I, I had to mention that. Uh, Nikki, thank you so much being out of time really appreciate it thanks for all those gems absolute honor this is a, a dream come true for me so uh you're you're a dental legend yeah so it's, it's great for me to be on here with you Thank you so much, Neki. My goodness, isn't Neki such a charismatic man? I mean, I love his uh, style of teaching. Uh, I love his deep voice. I love his AV setup. He's like been one of the best guests I've ever had in terms of good audio and video equipment. So kudos to you, buddy. Uh, like I said, if you want to join the course, if you want to find out more about the course, it's thirdmolarsonline.com. That's thirdmolarsonline.com. I've done it. It was sensational. And with the one-to-one -one mentoring that he gave me, I just feel really confident to tackle that case that really sparked my desire to learn more 
about tackling more complex wisdom teeth. So the code to use is Protrusive. Neki, thank you so much for giving 15% off to all the Protruserati. I hope you guys will make use of it. And hopefully Neki will also join us on our Telegram group to be our, our resident third molar expert. Neki, you did a fantastic job in this episode. Thank you so much. I'll catch you same time, same place next week, guys. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end.